Leaders eat last, but they always go first. What? That doesn't even make sense. I'm here to tell you that unless you grasp this really important critical concept, you're actually reducing your social influence and reducing your leadership and by association, your impact and your influence and maybe even your income. I'm Daryl Black, and if we haven't met before, I take my 30 plus years of experience in crisis leadership and 10 years of corporate project management and handling big, large scale disasters like Katrina and Canada's two largest disasters and help leaders and leaders of leaders really improve their leadership and their ability to connect with one another and their team and, and create a culture where people thrive. That's what I'm all about. It has been a long time, a very, very difficult time for all of us here. And, you know, I was trying to think when the last time was that I did, um, did a, a podcast episode and it was a really long time. And since then, an awful lot has changed. A lot has happened. And uh, the last 18 months, 19 months have been really, really challenging for a bunch of people. But one of the things that I've been involved in, and if you're following me on social or, or anything like that, you know that I've been leading and supporting a large scale project for a large humanitarian organization. Uh, one would argue that it's actually international with different chapters. And uh, I won't say the actual organization, but I can tell you the working there is a big plus. So I've been involved in a, in a large operation around COVID and related kind of things around that. And I've really been able to kind of stretch my legs with regard to my professional leadership and concepts and practicing what I'm preaching and continuing to just learn and learn and learn because leadership is a lifelong journey in terms of learning those skills and behaviors. And uh, I've been really, really grateful and blessed to have that opportunity and to work with amazing people. And during that period of time, it's, it's a national operation, literally from coast to coast, 500 people between four and 500 people, 17 sites, uh, both official languages and a myriad of others, as I might talk about in this episode. And it has been um, such a challenge. It's been a huge challenge. And just to give you a sense for the operation here, and then that, this will provide a bit of context for what I've been up to for the last little while and, and a lot of things moving forward that I'll be referring to. So it was uh, mid-February. I get a text and then a follow-up phone call from uh, VP of Emergency Management for this organization. I'd never talked to her before, never met her, you know, never heard of her. And uh, so she, we had a quick conversation, said, hey, you've been doing some good work on some other projects provincially. And um, just wondering if you'd be interested in helping with this operation. And I literally said, you know, I'm not, not interested in it, I guess. So that was February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, February 15th, it was her and I, and we were working through a spreadsheet, uh, RACI, for those of you in project management world, uh, responsible, accountable, communicate, and informed. So we're working on a RACI chart and uh, dealing with a big, well, a number of federal departments of which, frankly, I didn't even know we had like some of the names, but anyways. So we went from, from that experience for that initial phone call to um, a week later, uh, it would be to having five sites stood up and a couple hundred people, two or 300 people hired for those sites and uh, talk about crisis and all of the things. I'm, I'm in a new organization. At least I didn't know the organization from a national perspective. I didn't know a lot of the players. I didn't know a lot of the stakeholders. And I'm going into meetings that literally had uh, no word of a lie. They didn't have 75 people in it. And then there's just me and, and my boss who are the actual providers of this service. It was just like, boom, 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 time and time again, Zoom meeting, Teams meeting, Zoom, Teams, all that. And I'd hop onto a call and I literally wouldn't know who, who was on the call. And I wouldn't know what the subject was because it was just like breakneck speeds. So managed to get through that whole process. And within that, started the process moving 
logistics, so trailers and all of those other things, moving from, from that focus to now operations. So a lot more processes and standard operating procedures and getting the people in place and getting them trained up and all of that stuff. So you go from that initial chaos, that initial response, then you move quickly, as quickly as you can to the logistics and, and try to handle all that and then get into more processes. And that went on for, you know, a number of weeks. We're coming up with how do we operate consistently with the same standard-ish across the country, across seven sites, different languages, different workforce uh, demographics. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about that. So anywhere from new Canadians to uh, Canadians that have been around for a very, very long time in our country. And uh, just to give you a sense for the diversity, which was absolutely amazing, I was doing site visits last week or two weeks ago, just as we demobilized and um, on one shift, and this isn't unusual, we had five frontline workers and um, let's see, one was from Uganda, the Philippines, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and uh, Rwanda. Yeah, with that, the incredible team that, that we, we designed. So moving from, from the processes very, very, as quickly as we could as a leader moving into the culture and creating what right looks like with regard to the culture and making sure we have this diverse team, lots of different age groups, demanding work. It was outside remote locations in some cases. And, and how do we bring that into, into focus and, and into singular and purpose? And that's what I really want to talk to you about. And that is the jumping off point. So how do you take this, this whole kind of uh, melting pot of cultures and people and departments and, and all of the stuff and, and bring them together in as coherent and cohesive a team as you possibly can and have that sustain over the course of an operation, which in this case was like nine months and most of it remote. So it's very, very challenging. And I found myself saying many, 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 many times, what does right look like? Show me what right looks like. If you are faced with some sort of a decision that we don't have a clear answer for, like we don't have a standard operating procedure, what does right look like? We had a lot of uh, folks that were junior leaders. This was their first kind of supervisory job. And so instead of over prescribing, the guiding principle was always what does right look like? And this and that's the overall envelope that I, I said numerous, numerous times and that I operated in. And within that was leaders eat last, but they always go first, which on the surface doesn't make any sense, right? It seems kind of opposite. The whole reason for this is, is I've, I've really been faced with the reality, both through teaching again, getting back into that through live streams and, and interacting with people. There's still very much a paradigm in our leadership environment. And one would argue in our communities and our personal lives where the notion of a leader is, is kind of based on that bombastic, loud, um, strong, solid pillar, larger than life kind of person. The person that steps into the, into the middle of the circle and commands it, this charismatic individual, all of the kind of stereotypes and paradigms and archetypes and whatever else you can think of. And that is effective in certain circumstances. The problem is, is that approach no longer serves us. And in today's modern society, in today's modern workplaces with the, the operations that we have, the projects, the, the, the different market conditions, all of those things, that model of, of leadership, that leader centric model has to change. And I get it. I totally understand it because a lot of us grew up, that was our model of leadership. So one of two things happen. We would either go too far soft with individuals and we would let them, you know, kind of run amok or we were leading with an iron fist and leading by a culture of fear and you will do this and, and so on. So kind of those two extremes. Well, I'm here to tell you that somewhere in the middle is the right answer. And what does right look like? What does right look like? Leaders eat last, but they always go first. So what that really means is that leaders eat last means you support your team. You support them. You give them the resources, the training, the time, whatever kind of support, the coaching, the mentorship, whatever, whatever you need to give them, you give them. And in fact, on our operation, 
we didn't use the word chain of command or the phrase chain of command. We used chain of support uh, because as the leader, that was ultimately my job. So whatever, there are three or four levels between myself and the front line. And when I say between, I'm using air quotes. And so it was really, really difficult for me to interact with the individuals on the front line. But my job actually was to support them ultimately and, and working from that that level back and every layer we put in place was to support and not to command so that's uh that is a very clear and very effective example of leaders eat last so support your team it's not a chain of command it's a chain of support so it's always about putting the team first so that's the leaders eat last part but then what about this but they always go first even though i just said they eat last well, here's the other thing that we as leaders have to recognize and in some cases shift our thinking. And I understand it. It can be very, very difficult to be shifting a life or career of what right looked like in your head as, as a leader. And that was that if you want respect, you just become the leader and it's given to you. No ands, ifs, or buts. If you're, if you're on a team, you're to be seen and not heard, especially if you're young, you know, all of those other things that, that go along with what we thought leadership was. So that is often the model that we're raised in. And I totally understand it, but the model I'm telling you or suggesting to you and the model that I use consistently very much aligns with my personal values. And I've talked a lot about values on this podcast and the, the general guidelines, the general principles, the general values that I prescribe to, and I would suggest to you would work really, really well for you. Should you adopt one, two, or all of them? What does right look like? What does it look like to go first? Well, you need to be authentic first. So that means you are the one leaning in as the leader. You don't have the benefit of sitting back and, and expecting people to be authentic with you. You don't have the ability anymore, or at least you shouldn't leverage the fact that you have a certain level of position influence. I get it. You know, that that's kind of how we were, we were brought up through this, but that no longer serves us. So you want to be authentic first. And so what does authenticity mean in terms of leadership? And don't worry, we'll unpack this uh, at a later date, but it really means being consistent. Be who you are. I see time and time again, leaders, again, because they have a, a little bit of an outdated model of what leadership is, and, and they either try to duplicate that bombastic, leader-centric, forceful, uh, leading by fear uh, kind of approach, because that's how they learned, and they saw results from that, so they, they try to emulate that. Or they actually say to themselves, limiting belief is around, well, I'm not that person. I don't have the ability to command a room or walk in and be charismatic and, you know, a great speaker. I'm scared shitless of public speaking. I'll never be a leader. So those are some of the things that, that happen when you're not authentic. And so be you literally be you sure model a behavior, take the good, get rid of the bad, those sorts of things adopt frameworks, but be you be true to yourself. Don't try to be somebody or something that you're not. And so I see that a lot. And that's why it's really important for us. If we want authenticity in our workplaces and on our teams and in our community, you as a leader, you have to be authentic first. The next value, and this is my top value, and that is respect. You need to be respectful first. Oh man. How many times have I heard the team just doesn't respect me. They need to respect me. I'm their boss and nah, 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 nah. the list goes on and on and on all the BS excuses and, and these blind spots that a lot of us leaders have. Well, again, we don't have the benefit of sitting back and having respect poured onto us. We just don't, things have changed. So if we want respect in our team and if we want respect back, we as leaders have to be respectful first. Okay. So authenticity, really, really important. Respect, super important. The next one is vulnerability and you have to be vulnerable first. And I've talked a lot about vulnerability and its role in building trust and trust builds teams and strong teams drive results and outcomes. So if you're vulnerable, 
then the team sees that as an opportunity to connect. They see it as you are one of them because the old model used to be the opposite, right? It would be like the leaders here, followers are there and the leader would remind you very clear of what that chain of command was. That is, uh, that's, that's outdated, that's old school. So when we're vulnerable, what it means is, is, is we're sharing a bit of ourselves. We are being honest with the folks that we support. So an example of vulnerability would be, well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not sitting there crying your eyes out in front of the team. The kind of delineation for what's oversharing and what's not, and, and is it an appropriate use of vulnerability is, are you using vulnerability just for the sake of getting attention? Or are you using vulnerability in an attempt to move the team forward? So an example would be moving the team forward. Hey folks, um, boy, this is uh, this is complicated. We have a lot of moving parts here. We've got a lot of variables I, I just don't know. So I don't have an end game in, in mind necessarily here. You know, I don't have all the answers today, but I am committed to working through that. So it's okay to say that you don't know. Now, that is vulnerability in the in the context of, of advancing, right? You're building trust there and you're not oversharing. An overshare would be something, you know, some sort of childhood trauma that you've had or something like that. That's that's one of the, the areas that you can delineate. Is using vulnerability for the sake of the team and the project and the operation, or is it something that you're just oversharing and you want kind of sympathy in some cases? The next one is empathy. And boy oh boy. Boy, oh boy, empathy should be a superpower. And this is something I've rallied and railed and all the rest and, and will hop on that horse and ride it into the sunset all day long. Empathy is, is really the ability for a leader to understand where a team member or teammate is coming from. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's just holding space for them. And so it, 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 it's, it's not sympathy. And one of the differences between sympathy and empathy, because I see these changed quite often, is that if you picture like a fence and your teammate is on the other side of that fence, empathy says that you stay on your side of the fence, but you, you're talking to them, you're understanding them, you're seeing where they're standing, you're seeing where they came from, you're seeing what they're wearing, all of those things. That's empathy. Sympathy though, is when you cross that fence and now you're interacting and, and maybe your hands on them, or you're starting to feel now what they're feeling. That's the difference. A lot of people get that confused because empathy is critical because for you to influence another person, for you to learn how to communicate with them, for you to learn where they're, you know, what will motivate them, you have to understand where they come from. If they're coming to you with a particular situation or, or, or problem or issue, and in your head, you're like, well, I don't get it. Like it's pretty straightforward. Well, the empathetic leader says, Hmm, that's interesting. Well, guess what? They're new. They're new to this, this project. They're new to my team. Maybe this is a skill they don't have, or there's some challenges that they're having with some coworkers that are kind of putting, you know, putting some extra pressure on them, whatever that is. So that is empathy in action and leadership really depends on empathy. So we've got be authentic. We've got be respectful. Be vulnerable, be empathetic. Remember all of these things, you have to be that first. And last but not least is compassion. Be compassionate. Compassion is, is often an overused word in my opinion, but I think compassion is, is where you really, you really give a shit about the people. You literally do care about them. Now, not in a personal way or, or an inappropriate way, but you care that they're being heard. <clears throat> you care that they're getting what they need as a uh, teammate or as a person, whatever the scope of, of your, your influence is. And I'll also add one extra part to that compassion, and that is self-compassion. If we spoke to our friends like we speak to each other, we wouldn't have any friends. So as a leader, be compassionate first. And you would be amazed that when you bring all of these things together, any one of the, the, the values I talked about or any one of the principles I talked about, any one of the what does right look like leveraged 
individually will exponentially grow your leadership, your influence and, and your impact and ultimately your income just on its own. But when you, when you pack these together and, and you're stacking them and it becomes part of how you communicate who you are as a leader, you will see a team of 500 people. You'll see a team of five. You'll see a team of two really band together and, and be very, very loyal to you. And now not in an archaic kind of draconian way, but you will see them respect you because ultimately you are respecting them and you're showing what right looks like. So in the absence of any clear direction, when there's a decision to be made, when there's a personnel challenge or anything like that, of which during my particular operation, let's say thousands, thousands of situations like that. But I kept coming back to the philosophy. What does right look like? And the guidance I would give to the other leaders I support in our, in our operation was, Hey, show what right looks like. And if you don't know what it is, we can work with you on that, but ultimately show what right looks like. And in the absence of that clear direction, that will always be your anchor. That'll be the port in the storm. Thanks folks.